Hi, my name is Sarah Allen. I'm the clinical supervisor with Circle of Friends Services. Circle of Friends is a not-for-profit agency that provides therapy to kids in the child welfare system on the west coast of Florida as well as central Florida. Today I'm going to talk to you about case conceptualization, but not just case conceptualization, specifically for children that are in the child welfare system, which as we'll talk about is a very different animal than other types of cases that you might have. So con case conceptualization, I like to think of it as putting pieces to a puzzle together. You're trying to get all of the pieces that have been very fragmented by the child's life because of being in the child welfare system and put it together so that you can get a clear picture of not only what the what, who the child is, but how they interface with the world that they live in and potentially the world that they will be going back to. When I think about case conceptualization, it's really important that you remember that it's not just about gathering that information. There's actually, and to build a good master treatment plan, but there's actually a therapeutic value to conceptualizing a case. And that's why it's so important to me, even as the supervisor. The therapeutic value is that if I can hold the child's whole story, which is rare to find somebody who can do that, then I'm also encouraging and fostering even a cohesion of identity for that client when I'm with them in their therapy session. And being able to hold things that are too potent for others to be able to hold for them and be able to help them be able to work through that and show consistent positive regard regardless of what their history is. So when you're talking about putting pieces to the puzzle together, we have to, let's identify what those puzzle pieces are. Okay, because there are certain resources that we have to rely upon for kids in the child welfare system to get a good idea of what's going on. And for those of you that worked with this population, you know they've been sometimes to multiple homes, sometimes multiple states or cities. They could have had many case managers or guardian ad items involved. And so everything is very pieced apart and fragmented. And so it's really our job to advocate to be able to hold all this and even be able to relay some of this information in a cohesive manner to caregivers as well as other important figures in the child's life. So who do I go to to get these pieces of the puzzle? Some of the ones that I will look at obviously is the referent. Who did the referral come from? For us, the majority of them come from their child welfare case manager. Okay, And from the case manager, I want specific information. I would like to have the CBHA, which is the Comprehensive Behavioral Health Assessment. For those of you that may not be familiar with that, the CBHA is very important because it allows for us to have a full snapshot of the child's life as best we can, including the history of biological parents, as well as their previous placements, and even pieces of the CPI reports, Child Protective Investigation reports, about why they were removed. That information is sometimes very hard to get from a foster parent, especially if the child was just placed in that foster home. So sometimes the CBHA is the most comprehensive and cohesive document that you'll be able to find on that child when you first start working with them. So when I get a case and I introduce myself to the case manager, that's the first request I'll make is could you please send me a CBHA for that client if you have it on file. All of the children that are placed in the child welfare system into foster care should have a CBHA in their record that you should be able to have access to. In addition to that, the case manager may have some of the, he or she's own anecdotal information about the family that you're going to want to ask them about, about what their concerns are, what their observations are, and why they're referring the client to therapy. So they can also be a very important tool to getting all the pieces to their puzzle. In addition to that, you obviously want to be able to speak to the caregiver. Now the caregiver could be a variety of people. It could be a relative placement, so an aunt, uncle, or grandmother, or grandpa. It could be a foster home, okay, a group home. So really, it's part of us trying to get our hands on whomever we can to get some of this information about what things are looking like for the child in the home currently, uh, what their current symptoms are, what the current challenges and strengths that the child has at this point in time. So the caregiver is also another important piece or resource to getting those puzzle pieces that we need. If we can, it would be, it's wonderful to try and get information from the biological parent when that's appropriate to do that. 
uh, so that we might be able to get some additional information about what kind of a relationship they have with their biological parent, perhaps what was going on when they were removed from their perspective, and even some of those brief snippets of, of things that they might remember about the child as they were growing up, their developmental milestones and what their relationship was like with them when they were a baby. Because one of the things that I will talk about in just a little bit is the early life history is a fundamental piece in being able to conceptualize a, a case accurately. We also want to obviously rely upon our observation and interaction with the child in therapy. One of the things I'd like to note there is you are going to have different interactions with the child when you first go out to see them as you begin and then over sessions. So case conceptualization doesn't happen in, in one session. It happens over a variety of sessions and it develops over time. Many of you probably can relate to going out to see a client and realize, thinking you have a good handle on it and then you go out to the third session and something hits the fan and you realize, well, I had no idea that this was a part of what the child was struggling with. So it's something that will evolve and constantly evolve as you build a relationship with the client. You, when I go out to a client and I'm observing their interactions, I want to know what their interactions are like with their caretakers. Um, are they, do they go to them if they have a problem? Are they able to be soothed by the caretaker? Do they appear to feel comfortable within their home with their caretaker or even other children in the home? I also want to look to see how they engage with me for their first time. Are they comfortable with me? Are they standoffish? Are they trying to climb in my car? Um, all of those things that, that help me give an idea of what their understanding of the world is, the adults in their world, and even their ability to understand safe and unsafe. As I work with them, I continue to pay attention to how our relationship evolves and their ability to increase their comfortability with me and build a healthy therapeutic relationship with me. It's also important to be able to have interaction with their teachers uh, or guidance counselors if possible. I realize this one may be a little bit more difficult for school-aged children. Or even being able to see them a few times at their daycare or preschool for our younger children that we're seeing. This will allow you information to understand, again, how they interact with their peers outside of the home, but also gives you input about how they engage with their teachers and even how they're doing academically and developmentally, which is another important component that we want to understand about the child. So these are all pieces to the puzzle, right? All of these resources, if you will, I can pull together and I try my best to see the child as a whole, the system that they're in, and how they understand the world that they live in. It's also really important with conceptualizing child welfare cases that the therapist keep in mind what the case plan goal is. It, as a therapist, we don't decide what the case plan goal is. It's very important for us to know whether we're working towards reunification or they're working towards termination of parental rights and then to adoption. Or in some cases, they're working towards permanent guardianship. As you can imagine, each of those very different tasks are certainly going to have an impact on the conceptualization of the case as well as what you will eventually put in your master treatment plan. because. Doing case conceptualization is the foundation to building a very good master treatment plan to be able to meet that child's therapeutic needs, not only today, but so that the child can heal and hopefully be healthy into their lifetime and even into adulthood. So we have to keep in mind that of their case plan goal and include that as one of the pieces to the puzzle. So on occasion, if you're not able to get a real clear answer uh, from speaking to people, it's beneficial to ask for a copy of the case plan so that you can actually see on paper what's going on or if there might even be a concurrent goal. Because on occasion that will happen as well, that they're working on two goals simultaneously. So you've got all of these pieces that you have together or these resources building these pieces together. Now, what do I want to know? There's a lot of information I want to know when I start to work with a client. One of the biggest pieces to the puzzle that we want to understand was their early experiences. At Circle of Friends, we work with a very large amount of the infant mental health population. And so, but honestly, if you're working with a two-year-old or a four-year-old, their early experience is just as important if I'm working with a 16-year-old because it has such an impact on who they become and the way that they see their world and the way that they see themselves in the world. So I really ask these questions regardless of what age group I'm working with, but it's 
absolutely fundamental to explore when I'm working with the five and under population. So what do I say? What are those early experiences? What does that mean? I want to go as far back into their in utero experiences. I would like, if I possibly can, I want to know, was the pregnancy uh, planned? Did mom have prenatal care? Does mom have a history of substance abuse? Is there a possibility of substance exposure? Okay. Was there domestic violence when mom was pregnant with baby? And what kind of lifestyle, even if there were certain stressors and things like that going on for the mom at that point in time, it's really important for us to know that because there's more and more information coming out that the actual in uterine experience does impact them after they're born and even their emotional states and ability to regulate themselves. So I want to know about early experiences even back to in utero. In addition to that, I would like to know when they are removed from their parents and how many times they've been removed from their parents. So many times we work with kids, unfortunately, that have had multiple removals. Um, I have some cases right now that the child may only be four, but this is her third removal. And so it's important for me to know how old exactly was she when her first removal occurred? And then the subsequent removals, what was her age? It helps me to understand even some developmental milestones that may have been arrested in certain ways because of that occurring that naturally is going to impact their development okay, in a variety of ways. So when they were removed, obviously what happened to this child? Why was he or she removed? Getting specifically into is there a history of physical abuse, uh, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, um, neglect, was there any malnourishment or the lack of any nurturing care? I also want to know if there was any domestic violence in the home and their exposure to that or even possibly the frequency of that occurring, um, as well as going back again to parental substance abuse. So all of these pieces give us an idea of what, and almost a picture, of what it might be like to have been that child in that environment that they were in. It's also really important though to know, were there any compensatory figures? So. Mom might have been having a really hard time at that point in time, or perhaps dad is having a really hard time at that point in time, but was there a grandma that was consistent, or a grandpa or an aunt uncle, a safe nurturing figure that the child was able to be around and was an integral part of their life at an early point in time? Because what we know is that although mom and dad might have been struggling, it really can be healing and foster resilience for the children that we see just to have that one person. So I asked those questions too. Who else was there and what was the relationship like? Right? So in addition to that, I also want to know about their development, if I can. Sometimes this information is harder to get, especially if you don't have access to the biological parents or if things were in such a way in the home that the biological parents may not have been quite aware or as in tune to what the child should have been doing, whether they were meeting those milestones. But it's important for us to know, you know, how old was the child or around that way when they started walking? Um, how about potty training? If I'm working with a young child as young as two, sometimes it's easier for me to pick up on whether there was a developmental delay uh, because I'm able to see it right in front of myself at that point in time than if I'm working with an 11 year old that might have had a developmental delay that sent back to when he was two years old. I didn't see him when he was two, I'm seeing him when he's 11. So that might demand more uh, looking into some of that history and seeing if we can find any resources to let us know about developmental milestones. In addition to that, we want to even know about medical issues, okay? Does the child have any long-standing medical issues? Is the child on any current medication? Um, those things will also let us know not only what's going on emotionally for the child, but what the physical experience is of that child. I just was recently going over a case in supervision about a child who has a seizure disorder. This disorder that hasn't been very well managed for a variety of reasons has been a fundamental piece in the child's uh, building of her self-esteem and even trusting that people are going to take care of her if she was in the event of having an emergency like having a seizure at school or at home. And so that was an integral part in understanding what her life and the level of anxiety that she's currently having at this point in time. You can see in that situation if we miss that, we would be missing an enormous piece of what's actually contributing to the behaviors at this point in time. We also want to know 
specifics about the removal story, how it happened. Um, even if we can, you know, I've had some cases that it'll happen more in normal business hours, uh, not that it's ever a good time to be removed, but we have others that they've been taken from their homes in the middle of the night. This is important. In some of those cases, I, the children will have nightmares and things like that at the same time of the night when they were removed. When I understand some of those specific, that specific information, it helps me to understand why the child might be reacting this way. And then in turn, it helps me to be able to educate the caregiver of, huh, these behaviors make sense, right? So the other piece I wanna talk about that's really important with this, especially working within child welfare, is intergenerational patterns. Okay, so this actually goes outside of the child. It looks at what the patterns are from mom to grandma to great grandma to great great grandma. And one of the things that I have found doing this work for a while is that there's often very clear intergenerational patterns amongst the family. For example, with substance abuse, it may go back three or four generations or even domestic violence. This is so important for us to understand because it gives us insight into actually the culture of the family and what the child believes about the world, what the child believes about people, and even whether or not the child believes that things can get better and people are gonna be able to help them. And so this piece that we oftentimes don't go into is very important. And it also will be an important piece to understand if you are, if the goal is reunification. I need to know what those intergenerational patterns are if I'm gonna be able to help support reunification. I would imagine all of our goals as a therapist is if a child goes back home that we want things to be different and most of the time the parents want that and I know the children do. And so one of the ways I can do that is by helping the mom to understand how those intergenerational, intergenerational patterns are playing out in their relationship with their child. If I miss that step, it's more likely that this will continue to occur. So that's another piece almost outside of the child in itself that it's also really important for us to know, okay? So why do we want all this information, okay? The no-brainer is it helps us build hopefully a really good master treatment plan, which is very, very important, okay? It also helps us to identify what the best interventions are, not just good interventions, but the best interventions for that child, which some of the high-risk cases that we see, it's very important that we try to get the best interventions in there. It also helps provide the support to the caregivers. It's hard for the caregivers, especially foster parents and relative caregivers, who are going through all of these different things and are taxed by being involved in the system and helping care for these children and sometimes multiple children. It's important for me to help relay the history to them and put it together in a more cohesive package, if you will, so that they can understand it. It fosters empathy and it also will help them to help the child in their home every day and sometimes become even more invested in the therapeutic process. So it helps with that. And lastly, it helps to reduce just disjointed care. Like I talked about at the very beginning, going for a full circle, one of the challenges for these kids is everything is very fragmented and things don't make very much sense. And so when I'm able to do this and work with case management and work with caregivers and the child to even help them understand their, their history, it really helps to redu reduce the fragmentation and to bring some cohesion to who they are and even their identity. So that's an added bonus, if you will, outside of building a good master treatment plan and having good intervention. So I hope today that you've learned some more about how you might be able to conceptualize cases in the child welfare system. And my hope is, is that it will help you work with families better, your children better, and to build a better master treatment plan. Thank you.